So last week we were talking about the context uh, really and how even though in particular areas it not, might not say if any man, uh, some translations might say if anyone or if someone or what have you, but the way that they determine uh, the language and use the, uh, the, the male gender there is because of the context and the other requirements. And then we were picking up with, well, where do we get the idea or get the term pastor then? Because remember, a lot of people, they might not be familiar with the term elder because they're just familiar with pastor. Um, it was kind of interesting. I think I, I might have mentioned this, maybe not. I went into a, uh, a reformed group on Facebook, and I just very simply asked the question, you know, what is the difference between a pastor, a preacher, a minister, and an evangelist? So I just, those four things. What What's the difference? And... You know, basically, you get a whole lot of convoluted answers in the sense that, well, a pastor can be a preacher when he's preaching, but he's not just a preacher. An event, and then some people said, well, an evangelist cannot be a pastor or uh, a preacher if he's located in the congregation and evangelist is outside. So there's really, uh, in looking at it, and I only got about maybe, I think, 60 or 70 responses, they were kind of confused as well, even in their own belief system as to what the difference might have been and what have you. So it's no wonder that most people uh, will use the term pastor, not knowing that there's a difference. Now, part of that is because of the responsibilities that have evolved over time from Scripture. Um, not getting into it a whole lot, um, we have some example of what we would call located preachers, uh, where we have, you know, Paul staying somewhere for a couple of years or, or what have you. Uh, for the most part, though, and, and we get into it, uh, is elders were primarily doing the ones teaching. We have Christ. What did, he tell, what did Christ tell Peter to do? Feed my sheep, right? And we know that Peter was an elder. So a lot of people, uh, when they're mixing these terms around, they say, okay, well, who's the one who is feeding the sheep? It's generally the preacher in, in most congregations, uh, mainly. Or you might have the preacher who's mainly doing it, and maybe some others who are teaching a class or, or what have you. And so, um, so that's why there's that term. So where did the term pastor come from? Well, let me ask a question here. Would you be surprised to... The, to learn that the word pastor is not found in the Bible. Would that surprise anybody? Okay, I know that Pam did a great job with the ham, but y'all aren't all asleep. I can see your eyes open, right? So, uh, no, it's, it's not in there. When citing the term pastor, most reference the book of Ephesians there in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. Now, I've mentioned this before, but when I'm talking about uh, they, you know, I might say, well, they believe this or they believe that. Many times I am talking based on those that I have encountered or those that I have studied. It does come across as a blanket statement, but there are some, even in reform circles, who disagree with using the term pastor. Uh, for people, and they do separate that, that out. But Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 reads, And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. Okay. So it immediately looks like I put my foot in my mouth, right? Because, I mean, after all, I did just say that the word pastor isn't found in Scripture, and then you read Ephesians 4, 11, and, and there it is. Well, Yes and no. Um, the word that we read as pastor is poimen, or poimen. And its definition is a shepherd, uh, a, a feeder, a protector, or a ruler of the flock. 
So we might ask, well, why does it say pastor then instead of shepherd? Well, it really comes down to the translation history of scriptures. You know, there are uh, a lot of translations today um, are influenced by the King James translation. Uh, the King James translation, the, you know, it first came out in 1611. Well, the King James was influenced very heavily by the Latin Vulgate. If you were to go back before then, then most Bibles that you're going to find are written in Latin. Okay. Um, now, the, the King James, it was also uh, influenced by the Geneva Bible of 1560, the Bishop's Bible of 1568, um, you know, the, uh, the uh, Great Bible of 1539. All of those Bibles, though, they were translated from the Latin Vulgate. And you might say, well... Well, that doesn't really have any bearing on, on me today. Maybe I use a different translation or, well, the King James, you know, that was 1611. That's, you know, quite a while ago. Why, why does it even matter? Well, a little bit about the Vulgate is that it's largely, largely the work of, of a man by uh, Jerome of Stryden uh, in 382. And he had commis been commissioned by Pope D uh, Damascus I to revise uh, the Vetus La uh, Latina Gospels, which was used by, uh, by the Roman Church. Later on, uh, on his own initiative, he extended the work of revision and translation to include most of the books of the Bible. Okay? Uh, the Vulgate... It, it progressively uh, was adopted as the biblical text within the Western Church. Now, what's also interesting is that he did not have access to even a complete uh, Bible. In fact, uh, when translating the text, he didn't have all of the book of Revelation and had to borrow part of it and then make up part of it to actually fit into what was going into this, this translation over here. Well, we say that uh, the word pastor, it's not in the Bible, but we read Ephesians 4.11 and it's there. And the reason being is because the word pastor comes from the Latin noun uh, pastor, which means shepherd. And it comes from the verb pascare, meaning to lead to pasture, set to grazing, cause to eat. So. The term pastor also relates to the role of elder in the New Testament. So the reason that pastor is not in most translations, and it might say elder or shepherd or even presbyter or what have you, is because they are coming off of the Greek text and not off of the Latin text. So when we see pastor, it, we know that it's coming off of, of Latin. So it's actually not in the original language it's coming off of a translation of the language. Uh, you, you might look at it this way. Uh, if you have someone who speaks Spanish, and then you take what they say, write, write down in Spanish, and then you translate it over to Italian, and then you translate the Italian to, you know, we'll say English, right? You're not going to get an exact match. Yeah, you know, you're not going to get an exact match. Uh, some words don't, it, they exist in one language that they don't exist in another one. Or the ending of a noun might be different, uh, you know, or, or something that describes maybe uh, female gender in this language case is male in this language case or neuter in this case. So when we're looking at the word pastor there, it's coming from Greek, which was the original, that was then translated into Latin, and then instead of translating it from Greek, it was translated from Latin, so not the original language. Does that make sense, or did I just confuse everybody? Okay, you said it's translated from the Latin to the Greek, or from the Greek to the Latin? The Greek to the Latin. So the New Testament was originally written in Koine, which just means common, the Koine Greek, the common street Greek that everybody knew. Common street right. The common, the language of common man, it wasn't, you know, classical Greek of like the poets and philosophers and what have you. So Jerome translated from the Greek into the Latin because that's what the church was using. And that influenced these other Bible translations like the Bishop's Bible, the Geneva Bible, the Great Bible. 
Then King James comes along and he wants to have some things changed, partially because of his marriage situation and whatnot. So he wants some things changed. There's also the idea uh, regarding the, the mansions, you know, I've got a mansion over the hilltop, that type of thing. Um, so, but when it's tr the King James is translated, it's influenced by all of these other Bibles which came from the Latin instead of them going back to the original language. So that's why we end up with some terms that aren't actually in the text. Does that help? <laughs> you know, I'm just, you know, okay. If, if I do need to clear something up, please let me know. Please let me know because the last thing I want is it to be complicated, even though it can be complicated. Pretty much, yes. Um, the, the, ax, the actual term, depending on where you're looking, is presbyteros, which means presbyter, which can be translated as presbyter, it can be translated as elder, it can be translated as shepherd, uh, and what have you. Uh, and so when people, and, and you know, it's, and you'll see in some denominations, for example, if you have the, the preacher who they'll call the pastor and he also ha happens to be uh, an elder, they'll call him like a elder pastor, they'll hyphenate it, or maybe they'll call him pastor teacher to say, okay, he's, he's an elder, but he's also teaching, you know, that, that type of thing. Uh, but yeah, the, the terms elder, overseer, bishop, pastor, shepherd, presbyter, they all mean the same thing. Uh, they all mean the same thing when discussing matters of the organizational makeup uh, of, the, of the church. Um, but it is good to familiarize ourselves with it. One, because even some people of that belief system don't know why they use that particular term. As, you know, me going on there, simple test. I'm going to go in this Facebook group over here, ask a very simple question, see how many responses I get. And even they are confused as to why they use the term. So it's important for, for us to know. Yes? Yeah, who chose to start calling teachers pastors when they're not really pastors? I mean, who chose that? Or do you know? Uh, I don't know. Um, well, with... Um, I think the earliest is Jerome's translation going to the Latin. Because, it, it, you know, at the time when he was translating, the main, because the, the main, I'll, I'll, say, I'll say church, but the main church was Catholicism. You know, they were the, they were the biggest group uh, that was around everywhere. They spoke Latin, the priests spoke Latin, all the services were in Latin and what have you. And so uh, I, from what my understanding is in looking at the history of Bible translations, his would have been the earliest to actually, to actually use that. And then, of course, you know, King James comes along and he breaks away from uh, the Catholic Church and declares himself King of England uh, and the supreme ruler of the church. And so that, and, you know, it was during that time of like Anne Boleyn and uh, Catherine of Aragorn and what have you, where he kind of breaks off and says, nope, the Pope's not having it. Um, but yeah, beginning with uh, Catholicism, there's uh, been a lot of debate over, uh, over these terms. So, uh huh? When people call the church, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And Yeah, and and in all honesty, I used to I used to sit there anytime someone would call me pastor, I would sit there and say I'm not not the pastor, I'm just the preacher because, you know, that's what I am. Um and then it reached a point to where I'm just kind of you could just call me Mike. You know, that's fine because and, and the reason for that 
is one, they're, they're not doing it to be mean or harmful or, or anything. It's a lack of knowledge on their part. And the fact of the matter is, if they're not a Christian, them calling me pastor is the least of their worries, you know? And, and so I just kind of, okay, maybe we can maybe get into that then. Uh, just call me Mike. That's fine, you know? But yeah, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll work on that sometime down the road or, or whatever. But, yeah. Mike, yes. Can I ask a sure, if you like. Okay. Uh, where does deacons fit into this? Well, we actually are going to talk about deacons right after that, okay. or right after the the elders. I'm just a little, trying to be no, no, not at all, not at all. It's a it's a great question because when we're when we're talking about uh, the 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 makeup, the organizational structure uh, of it, we want to be clear, and so we are kind of going in order. Uh, with regard to the church in the sense that Christ is the head of the church that we talked about last week, and then there are, there are elders or shepherds or what have you. Uh, and be beneath that, I, I mean, I'll explain it more when we get to that point. Everybody's kind of on an equal, everybody's on an equal playing field, you know. Uh, just because someone is an elder, that doesn't make them better than anybody else in the congregation. It's a different role that they take. It's a different responsibility that they have. Yes, unfortunately, some will take a big head about it and say, no, it does make me better, you know. Um, it's an unfortunate thing, but the same thing happens with preachers, happens with deacons, it happens with members sitting in the pew who aren't any of those things. You know, it's kind of that Old Testament. Pride goes before destruction, an arrogant spirit before a fall. But, and exactly right. We are all human. The last I checked, that gender has not changed. So, now, hey. Okay, I'm going to move on from that one. I'm getting, I'm getting looks. Uh, yes. Uh, so we have elders, and then we ask, well, what is, the res what is exactly the responsibility of an elder? Which is an important question to ask as well, because some people will say, well, a pastor is the same thing as an elder, right? But when you look out in the religious world, and let's be honest, people don't, when people see Christians, they don't see Baptist, Presbyterian, Methodist, Mormon, they don't see that. Everybody is Christian that believes in Christ, right? But it's important for us to know, even when looking at the responsibilities, because you might have a, a set of biblical elders, but obviously they're not the same thing as these 15-year-old kids on bicycles who use the title of elder, right? Right? So it's important to know what uh, some of the responsibilities are. Um, again, uh, Robert Taylor Jr. wrote a great book, uh, the, the Elder and His Work. I've got a couple of copies in my office if anybody wants to borrow it. So the responsibility of elder. Now we can find the chief aim of an elder by looking at the words from Peter in 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, if, if y'all want to turn over there. Y'all know me. I'm big about y'all seeing it in, in your own Bible there. I don't want you to take my word for it or anything. But 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, says, Therefore I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight not under compulsion, but voluntar uh, voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. So, I mean, this right there, it addresses so many things. Not only the responsibility of an elder, but the manner in which they are to carry out those responsibilities. You know, we just mentioned, or I just mentioned how some elders, they can get a big head about themselves. Well, it clearly says right there, you're not supposed to lord that over people that you're, 
that are in your charge because you're not better uh, than anybody else. I'm not better th than anybody else. You know, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But instead, they're supposed to be examples. You know, a, an elder is someone there in 1 Peter chapter 5 is someone who is supposed to be an example. You are to want to, you are to be able to see that man and say, I want the type of faith that he has, you know. Well, we can look at Paul, we can look at Peter and John and all of them, and that's great. But we can't actually see them acting out their faith, right? We read the letters, but how were they day to day? You know, we don't know. Uh, I'm not saying that they were wrong or sinful or I'm uninspired. I'm not saying that. But there is a difference between reading the words that Peter wrote, for example, and if you were alive during Peter's time and actually walking with him day to day. So when we're looking at elders, they're to have, the, they're to not lord their position over people. They're to have the type of faith that one can look at and see that they're not just, you know, an elder in name, but they actually practice, you know, what they believe and what they understand. Um, but the main key there is in verse 2, shepherd the flock of God among you. We, we've got to pay careful attention to that because in just those seven words, again, there's still a lot revealed. Now, the word shepherd uh, in the Greek, uh, it means to feed, to nourish, to tend a flock, keep sheep, to furnish uh, pasturage or, or food. Uh, and again, the, the concept of feeding and tending to the sheep is spoken by Christ when he speaks to Peter. Right? Feed my sheep, feed my lambs, depending on, on the translation. Um, the NASB 1995, it renders the word tend. Uh, the King James says feed. Uh, in that. Uh, but the elders are to care for the people's souls, and we're to respect them for it. It doesn't mean that we're going to agree with everything that they say. And it doesn't mean that they're going to be right in everything that they say. We are to weigh all things against what? Against the scriptures, right? Doesn't matter who's talking. Doesn't matter if it's an elder, doesn't matter if it's a preacher or a deacon or anybody else, we measure all things against the scriptures. Because I'll tell you right now, there was only one perfect person to ever walk this earth. And his name wasn't Paul, his name wasn't Peter, his name wasn't John, it was just Christ. That was it. Granted, yes, they were inspired, I'm not taking away from that. But what I'm, my whole point being is that there is no perfect people. We weigh everything that, that we can against the, the scriptures. Um, Hebrews 13 and verse 17. Hebrews 13 and verse 17, speaking of them caring for people's souls and, and us respecting them for it. Hebrews 13, 17, obey your leaders and submit to them. For they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy. And not with grief, for this would be unprofitable to you. I mean, there's some things there. We look at that, let them do this with joy. Now, how are we supposed to let elders do that with joy? Not fight them over everything? Respect the position? If they tell us something that maybe we should be paying attention to, and we look at the scriptures and we find that they're right, don't grieve them over it. Don't give attitude about it. You know, let them do it with joy and don't cause them grief because ultimately that, that's unprofitable for us. You know, there in Hebrews 13 and verse 17. Um, and they're going to give a, an account uh, for that. You know, it, it's very interesting. We, we kind of have a different model for elders now than perhaps the early church, right? You know, the first church building wasn't formally recognized really until about 400 years after the first century. So we're talking in the 500 somewhere, right? Up until that point, most of the time, people worshiped in their homes. Today, we call them house churches, right? 
And it's interesting because a lot of times today, people will say, well, you, in a house church, you can't have elders, you know, because you don't have a building or something to meet in. Oh, actually, before church buildings really became a thing, an elder was severely involved in your home. If they were to, for example, walk into your home and see... I don't know, I guess today the equivalent of maybe a painting on the wall or, or something like something in your home that would seem to be ungodly. As an elder, they would let you know that you should take that out of your home, that you should get rid of it, that it didn't belong there. Now, there's a certain humility that comes with that because men, we've been brought up, our home is our castle, right? We are lord over our homes, you know, that type of thing. So for the man, especially at that time, could be very difficult to say, this guy doesn't even live here. You know, he doesn't live here. He doesn't pay my rent. That's, this would kind of be the attitude today, maybe. He doesn't pay my rent. He doesn't pay my electric. He doesn't go to my work. What right does he have to come into my home and say, I can't have that picture on the wall? That would kind of be probably the attitude today, right? But when we get before church buildings, that's exactly how elders operated. They were heavily involved in your life. I mean, you could see, and granted, yes, town sizes were much smaller as well, but people knew who the elders of the church were in the community as well and respected them for it. And they went to the elders for counseling and, and things, of, things of that nature. So it, there, there's a lot, there's, so there's a little bit that's, well, a lot that's changed. This tending to, this feeding the sheep, it took more than just, you know, one central building uh, where people go to, unfortunately. Um, a way to look at it, you know, a lot of the downside or, or downfall, rather, of society. Uh, and, and I'm going to try not to get preachy here. But uh, a lot of the downfall of society is partially because of the home and the way that the home has fallen apart. And a lot of homes have fallen apart because they do not have Christian parents. Or perhaps they only have one Christian parent. Maybe the other's there, but not a Christian, or maybe the others a deadbeat and ran off, or maybe they the, the, the passed away or what have you. Well, back then, when shepherds, elders were going into the home and helping people on family worship, on the dynamics of the home and what have you, the families grew closer together, they bonded, and the church grew. Well, now, elders... Predominantly, this is not all elders, so people watching this on YouTube, you know, don't get your hair in a ruffle, uh, is predominantly we see most elders when we come together for services. Uh, a lot of elders don't go to people's uh, homes. Now, I've known some elderships that do, some wonderful elders who they made it a plan to, you know, I'm going to have a meal every week with a different family and get to know them and, and all of that. But, but for the most part, we have put elders as figureheads, and that's our fault. And we, we have to look at the responsibilities of elders and have them accountable for that. Not to try to say that we're over them, but so that everybody understands what their responsibilities are because we're to submit to them and they're to emulate the faith that we would want to have, right? Any thoughts or comments or disagreements or, or questions? That's, that's fine if you disagree or just plain don't all like me. Don't tell me that you don't like me, though. I mean, that hurt my feelings, but... Okay. Um... So, in this concept here in Hebrews 13, uh, 17, it also extends to the fact that elders are to be teachers. And we might ask why, but we find the reason over there in the book of Titus uh, that also has qualifications for elders. If you look at Titus chapter 1, Titus chapter 1 and verse 9. Okay. 
Titus chapter 1 and verse 9 they're talking about this qualifications for elders, so we know that they're to the shepherd the flock, right? But we have holding fast to the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching, so that he will be able to both exhort in sound doctrine, so he's able to encourage, he's able to uplift, he's able to, to correct all, all of this in sound doctrine, and to refute those who contradict. So elders are to be teachers. That's something that they are actively supposed to be doing. And they're doing that not only to teach the flock to ensure that sound doctrine is being taught, but they're kind of keeping themselves on their game as well to be able to refute sound doc or false doctrine. Now, what happens most of the time, we'll say, I'll say most of the time, certainly not all of the time, what happens most of the time in congregations where someone is talking a bib, about a biblical error, an unsound doctrine, where do most people go to? Preacher, most of the time, not all the time, but the preacher, most of the time. Could that be one of the reasons why the term pastor has become so prevalent? Because even in the church, most people go to the preacher. They don't go to the pastor, the elder, or the elders, I should say, since it's plural. And yet, the elders are supposed to be functioning as teachers. They should, uh, and I, I asked this same question, I'm going to ask it again, but I asked this question when this class was on Thursday night. Who has the most, who typically has the most Bible knowledge in the, congreg in, in the congregation, in maybe most congregations. Okay, so we've got preacher. Okay, elders. Teachers. That's her. That's the one that, that's honestly the one that I'm thinking about. Uh, is, is the old woman sitting in the third pew. Now, if y'all are one of those ladies who sit in the third pew here, she was not calling y'all old. <laughs> and she did not specify if it was third from the back or third from the front. So, <laughs> But no, generally, we typically think that it's the preacher because they've gone to school, you know, and they've dedicated so much schooling to it, whatever it may be. Or we might think that it's the elders because of the position that they're in. I'll tell you right now, I'm no, I have rarely find, found it to be the elder. I'm not saying that the elder doesn't have biblical knowledge. I'm not saying that elders can't have a lot of biblical knowledge. Just in my experience, and in not just personally, but also in me talking to elderships, I've rarely found an elder who has more biblical knowledge than the preacher, but the person who outweighs them all is the uh, 70 years young woman sitting in the third pew that doesn't really talk a whole lot, but if she were to get into a debate with the preacher, he'd lose very, very quickly. It's the woman who is sitting there who people don't know, but the reason they had 30 baptisms that year is because she was studying with every single one of those people behind the scenes. You know, that's typically the person that has it. Now, why can't that be every member of the congregation? You know? Okay, so it was a rhetorical question, but in case you didn't hear, Don would like to say it's because we're not all 70 years old. Um... I think the truth is, is that we don't spend as much time in the Word of God as we could. Amen. I mean, we can spend two hours or three hours watching the latest Avengers movie, but we can't spend 45 minutes or an hour reading or actually studying our Bible. You know? Uh, I mean, uh, many in here have been members of the church for almost their entire lives. Some for, I'm not going to say how many decades, you know. Uh, but you remember that it used to, you know, I mean, there was even a phrase. It, it, you know, if you were in a court of law, if you didn't have a Bible, just put your hand on someone's head from the Church of Christ, and that was good enough. I know some of y'all, I know I'm not the only one who's heard that phrase. You know, yes. <laughs> from someone other than me, you know. 
That used to be a thing, though. If you want to know anything about the Bible, ask someone in the Church of Christ, because they will know. But it's not that way anymore. And we've got to get back to that. And we need biblical elders, to, to, if we can, to help that. So we look at this here, to exhort in sound doctrine, to refute those to, who contradict. Exhort in the original language, it just means to, to encourage people uh, in what is sound doctrine. It's no different than what the preacher should be doing on a Sunday morning or on a Wednesday night in class. It's just to present sound doctrine and, and try to encourage people in, in that doctrine. But again, elders, preachers aren't perfect, so we weigh everything against the scriptures. Uh, the term refute is uh, just to speak against, to oppose. If someone is spewing out false doctrine, then an elder should be able to stand there and refute that doctrine. He should be able to oppose that. Now, does that mean he's always going to oppose it successfully? No. Just like a preacher won't always oppose it successfully. Sometimes a person might present an argument that, that the elder or the preacher or whomever hasn't heard before. Or maybe a different way of looking at it, and it might stop them on their tracks. But the point is that they're, they are there to be able to do that, to try to do that. So elders are to teach so that they can encourage brethren in sound doctrine, scripture, while at the same time having such a knowledge of the Bible that they can oppose false doctrine. And that, that teaching, it might take on many forms. It might be one-on-one uh, -on -one instruction, it might be a class setting, it might be group settings uh, or group studies, it might be preaching. So the teaching takes on several forms. I don't want us to be of the thought that it's, oh, he has to have a class, you know, on Wednesday night or Sunday mornings to do that. No, that's not what it means. But if you just have an elder who doesn't do anything as far as teaching is concerned and all he's focused on is you know the money that comes into the collection which sadly that's most elderships um, then I said most not all and I'm only going on my experience do what do what well I'm when I say focus on that I mean that generally they're the ones that are kind of this is the money, this is what we do with it, and, and whatever. I'm not saying that they're just money grubbing and, and what have you. That, that's not me. That's, that's a whole other preacher who says that one. If you'd like his name, I can tell you afterwards. Um, and again, and I realize that it's difficult because honestly it makes me sound like a jerk. Uh, and, and I'm not trying to. But there's a lot of things that you can't say when it comes to Scripture without it coming across as a blanket statement. It just, it kind of is what it is. It's, it's one of those things, if it applies to you, then hey, take it to heart, maybe look at it, maybe examine yourself, examine what you're doing. If it doesn't apply to you, well, you're an elder, you're supposed to have patience, so forgive me and move on. That was supposed to be funny. That's okay. All four viewers to our YouTube channel didn't find it funny either. Um, notice also the words among you uh, there in verse 2 uh, when, we, uh, when we go back. Uh, the among you. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. I said verse 2. That... Um, there in uh, 1 Peter chapter 5. So what does that mean? Well, the word we read as among is, uh, its definition is in the realm or the sphere of, right? Um, we can relate that to the neighbor that's spoken of throughout the New Testament. You know, who is your neighbor? Well, the word neighbor it means the one who is nigh unto you, the one who is closest to you. And uh, many times what will happen, so with this qualifications of elders, it's to shepherd the flock of God that is among you, right? Not just members of that congregation. If let's say, you know, I were to take my family on vacation, 
sometime, I don't know, I've never really taken one, but if we were to take them, go on vacation, and we worship at a congregation, we'll say in Phoenix, right? That elder, even though I am not attached to that congregation, has a responsibility to watch out and make sure that I am getting sound instruction. Right? It's not just, oh, well, Mike and his family, they're visiting. It's great that they're here. If they see some error, you know, whatever, no big deal. No, it's you are to shepherd the flock of God that is in your circle, that it, you are in the sphere of, that you, are, that you are close to. It's not just this church membership idea, right? It is those that are there. Whether they're a visitor or not, basically it comes down to whether someone's a visitor or not, the elder has a responsibility to ensure that sound doctrine is being taught. I mean, it, it really is just that simple. And we need to be able to submit to that eldership. So if I'm traveling to Phoenix, I need to recognize still this man is an elder. Do I know what type of elder? No. I have to trust my brothers and sisters in Christ who saw that he fit, you know, the qualifications in 1 Timothy 3 and in Titus, and he's installed as an elder, so I need to submit to him, not cause him grief about it. Keep causing, you know, if every visiting Christian caused grief, they might not want visitors anymore, you know? Um, and and that's, just, that's just the chief aim uh, the, the, the highest aim to shepherd the flock. And, and, and the purpose of uh, these studies, again, it's, um, it's just general uh, information. We're not going to go any further into the responsibilities uh, of elders, because really that's going into all of the qualifications and, and as much detail as you know I would take. It would, well, we'd be here until Christ came back. Uh, any questions or, or comments so far? Yes, ma'am. I had a situation where uh, my elder, we were visiting a congregation, and he told the preacher he was wrong. That he told the preacher, the elder told the, the elder at that congregation. No. Oh, your elder. Larry went and took him and took him aside. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He corrected him. Yeah. I don't know if that's right, but he told them we won't be back. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he, you know, uh, I, hopefully, you know, he didn't just tell them it was wrong. Hopefully, he maybe told them why or something, why. you know. Um, but no, uh, you know, because uh, that's the thing is, uh, as, as an elder, it, it's, you know, like in that case, y'all going somewhere else, as an elder of the Lord's church, he has a responsibility to bring error to the attention of whoever it is. Now, does he have, you know, does he have any right to try to, you know, issue some type of discipline on that preacher, what have you? No. But as an elder, just like, and really, that, that's not even him as an elder. That's us as a Christian. If I'm visiting somewhere... You know, even if I weren't a preacher, if I'm visiting somewhere and there's something wrong or something that says wrong, I'm going to question it, and I'm going to let the person know about it. You know, depending on his response, then if they have elders, I'll probably go to the elders and point it out, you know, and say, hey, look, I'm, I know I'm just visiting here, but this is what I see in the scriptures versus what he said, and, and hope that they address it, you know, but... No, he, he wouldn't be wrong in, in letting him know that, hey, you know, you're, you're wrong and kind of this is why. I don't know how he said it, obviously, but no. I've always thought the responsibility of the elder mm -hmm. is to seal the house and not sell Yes. And that that is basically it. If they don't make decisions on what they're going to do, they don't make decisions. Yeah, and, and that's one of those things that, that's changed is, you know, when we look at elders in Scripture, it is primarily to keep watch over the souls. And now I know that I sometimes make these snide comments about, well, elders just pay attention to how much money comes into the collection, and they pay attention to who's doing this and all of that. And, and yeah, that's not the function of an elder. You know, an elder is to watch out for people's souls. I disagree with you. 
Sure. Because part of our duty as a Christian mm -hmm. is to contribute to the causes of the church. Sure. Yeah. If you're not doing that, then you are sinning. The elder has a right to tell you you need to well, that's easy. You have to carry yourself. Yeah, I think it, and and maybe I'm wrong in in my understanding because I was taking it to you to me what you were saying, Pam. I was taking it to mean as they were kind of not that they were encouraging, but they were trying to be the boss over everything. It, it, did I take that wrong, or how did you mean it? Right. Yes. Sure. They're concerned about my soul. Right. Like they should be. Right. Exactly. Now I'm confused, honestly. About what? Shepherd by flock is what it says. That's right. Right. As an elder, you're supposed to shepherd those people. Right. So what were you what were you saying when they care for your souls and that's it? I guess that's where I'm confused. Yeah, so what else what else is the elder's responsibility? You've not gone into it, but what else is it? Oh no. Okay, okay. <laughs> Cause I was like I was lost for for a second there. No, I, really it was uh going into the responsibilities that we create for elders that don't actually exist. You know, we say for for ex I'll Prime example, for example, uh, with the giving. You know, I'll take the whole treasury route here. In 1 Corinthians 16, when we're told to give, Paul clearly gives uh, indications as to who's to handle the money. Someone that you trust and what have you. In a lot of congregations, it's generally, yeah, they might have a treasurer, but the elders are the ones who decide where the money goes, what mission works are going to be supported, and, and all of this. And really, that's not the place of an elder. It can be, but a lot of them take that responsibility and don't allow anybody else to, to have any say about it. Do what? For, for like the money? Uh, based on 1 Corinthians 16, it's someone that the congregation trusts. Now, I'm not saying that we can't trust elders. I'm not saying that an elder can't handle the money. Uh, I'm just saying that uh, a lot of, a lot of the, in my experience, just personal experience, that has been a primary responsibility that they've taken and watching over people's souls has become a secondary thing. They have business meetings about we're going to do this, 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 and this, and yet those business meetings do not often include evangelism, mission works, the doctrine of the church, or anything. It's more of how we're going to spend this money. What programs are we going to do here? What are we going to... Dude, that's not your job. You know, just... Watch over people's souls, you know. Uh, make sure that sound doctrine is being taught. Teach sound doctrine yourself. Correct the, the doctrine when it's wrong. Uh, yeah, just there's responsibilities that we've set up that aren't, aren't in Scripture. And there's just so many that I wasn't going to go over into the, the detail of it. But any thoughts or comments? And that's, all, that's okay. I mean, I, I know it can be a hot button topic and everything, and it's all right to disagree, you know? Anybody? Bueller? Bueller? Oh, yes, sir. Matters of expedience. Sure. In my opinion, should not be upon the elder's shoulders. Yeah, it's, and if you if you don't know, you know, it might be, expedience can be a lot of things. It could be, you know, hymn, hymnals or, you know, paperless hymnals, things like that. But um, you, we have to consider, people get stretched thin. And if the elders are burdened with so much that it has nothing to do with watching people's souls, 
then how well can they watch anybody's souls? You know, we all have a responsibility to the church to contribute to the effectiveness of the local body. But if it's only left up to a few, and this goes for anything, that those people eventually get worn out. They, they get stretched thin. Just look, the wonderful ladies who, who do the Wednesday night meals get stretched thin, you know, because of doing it. The greeters or people locking up the building get tired of being the last ones out the door because no one else wants to stay around and do it. Or no one else wants to show up earlier to open up the doors or turn on the lights or, or whatever the case may be. So, I, and I just use those as examples. So if we put things like that towards the elders, are they really able to watch out for anybody's souls? If anything, they'll get more tired of the people that they're supposed to be shepherding. I mean, really? I'm so tired of this guy. I know I'm supposed to be watching over his soul. Uh, his soul, but, but yeah, he's got, he's got more than one. He's, he's that double-minded man in James, okay? He's got two souls. <laughs> but it's like, I know I'm supposed to be watching over him and everything, but he's just driving me bonkers, and I'm not sure I want to be in heaven with him anyway, so, <laughs> you know, I'll open up the elevator for him. Yeah, you know, you know we, we all need to, to contribute, but that's mainly what I was referring to was unscriptural responsibilities that we put on them because we don't want to do it ourselves. Any thoughts or comments? I hope I cleared that up at least what I, I hope I cleared up at least what I was saying. Maybe not. Anybody? I got a C. Uh, okay, we'll just stop it there and pick up next week on Can There Be Only One Elder? Who knows the answer? Are you sure? No. Do I? You're like, I'm looking at the notes and they say no. <laughs> uh, any announcements come in while we've all been sitting here? Any announcements? Like anybody get a text from anybody saying, you know, I broke a toe, I'm in the hospital or anything like that? I would, I would appreciate it if you would keep my great nieces, baby, daughter. Her name is Delaney. Delaney? And she is your great niece. great niece. See, people laugh when I ask if any announcements came in while we're sitting here in class, but that was not here before when class started. So, uh, any other uh, any announcements? Maybe that I forgot. Okay, uh, let's close with a quick prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we've been afforded to study a portion of your word and to, to fellowship. Uh, we would also ask at this time for Sister Peggy's great niece, Delaney, and um, suffering from RSV, knowing that she's just one year old. And, and Father, we pray that you would be with the family, be with those that are attending. Uh, to her and, and help us to be a source of strength as well, that we would lift them up in prayer, knowing that the prayers of the righteous availeth much. And Father, we know we're but dust and ash, but, but we feel that you have given us the authority to ask those things of you and to cast all of our cares on you. As we depart, we pray that you would go with us, that we might go out into the world and, and lead others to the cross, that they might hear the gospel and learn what they need to do in order to be saved. Be with us as we do these things. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.